We're here at Copper State looking at an airplane that, geez, we haven't seen for quite a while, but we're delighted to see one again. This is Airbike, and you're going to hear a bunch more about this from these two gentlemen. I'm Dan Johnson talking with Mike Jefferson and Scott Severin. Mike Jefferson is the new owner of this airplane not so long ago. When did you pick this thing up? I bought this thing about two months ago. Two months ago. Yep. And you flew it here from California is the story. Yes, is that a true story? Yes, I did. All right. Tell me a little bit about that story, Mike. It was a, a great flight. It was kind of long. It took uh, 16 hours to fly here. 16 hours. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Three great. days. Three days of flying. Three days of flying. 16 hours. And where from in California? We started in Red Bluff, California, which is in the northern San Joaquin Valley. Okay, so well north of San Francisco? Yes. Okay, so that's a pretty good haul down here to Arizona, all right. Yes, it is. What motivated you to make the trip, Mike? Well, um, I just got my pilot's license and I got about 100 hours of flying in. And uh, we just put this thing together, put a new motor on it. And I was like, let's go fly it somewhere. <laughs> so I, I saw the Copper State thing and just thought, you know, I'll come out here and see what's all about. Cool. Well, good for you. So you got 116 now. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and you'll get uh, probably some more going home, I'm guessing. Yes. Another right. 16. Hopefully, if the winds are right, we'll get another 16 on the way home. So I want to shift over to Scott here and just ask a little bit about the history of this particular, not this particular one, but this style of airplane. Scott, you developed this back in, well, back when? Well, back in the 90s. Of course, Wayne Eisen was really the brainchild and uh, the designer at Team Aircraft. And I was fortunate enough to be able to work with Team uh, for a period of years back then. Um, yeah, team was building the all-wood aircraft, the mid-wing and high-wing tail draggers. And, uh, and uh, interestingly, wood became hard, harder and harder to find good clear spruce, which is what we used in this, and some white pine and some birches. And uh, to get enough of the wood that we needed for the volume and the production we had was becoming more and more of a challenge. <clears throat> so Wayne was thinking, well, you know, maybe we'll do a, a steel tube uh, fuselage. Well, what do you think? So we toss it around and, oh, well, let's give it a shot. It was completely, completely out of the box of what Team Aircraft had ever done. It was all wood, all wood, except for the struts. And, and a, a few wings. aluminum parts, but uh, yeah, no practice. steel, no welded steel no, to no, my experience at all. Always everything with wood, 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 wood. So it was a great uh, expansion, a uh, learning process for uh, for Wayne and then our engineer, Jim Colley, uh, who worked with us on staff. He had uh, good knowledge about steel structures and trusses and all that sort of thing. So it, it was a real natural fit and a super fun development project there at Team. It was uh, yeah, some of the funnest time I ever had in my career was working at Team and putting all this stuff together. And the credit needs to go to Wayne. You know, he was just the consummate designer. And uh, thanks, Wayne. <laughs> He's gone great, now, great but he did, a, he did a lot of great work uh, over many years. Yeah, so. you bet, you bet. So, yeah, I, I had some influences in the aircraft, certainly, and, and uh, was thrilled to be a part of it. Now, this is an aircraft you sort of ride, fly, ride, whatever, uh, on, not in yeah, so the, much. The slogan that we came up with is we get on, we get on it, not in it. <laughs> it's an air bike, right? <laughs> it is. It, <laughs> That's it why looks we like called it. it an air bike, because you get on it. Now, Mike, uh, what drew you to this particular airplane? Uh, you, you're a hang glider guy, which is uh, familiar ground for both Scott and I. We both came out of hang gliding, so that's good stuff for us too. But you're a hang glider guy, and you learned how to fly the tugs that tow hang gliding hang gliders up. That's the right. Dragonfly, it's called, and there's one that's made very near you right now. And uh, they have SLSA approval and all the right stuff, so they're they're proper little airplanes. But they're made for that one purpose. So what drew you to this? Well, I've always liked this design and the looks of it. So, um, like you said, I learned to fly on a Dragonfly, which is a tail dragger similar to this. And uh, I got my sport pilot's license. And I got 100 hours in a RANS airplane. And then I decided to buy this one instead. So I sold the RANS to get this airplane. All right. And uh, I, when I went to look for one, there was none for sale. But there's a small group on Facebook. And I put on there, hey, I want to buy an air bike. Who's got one? I found three in the country that, that would let them go. Is that right? Yeah, and the closest one was a guy in Tucson. So I drove to Tucson and put down the money and hauled it back on a boat trailer. So you kind of brought this airplane back home, in a manner of speaking. Yeah. Tucson's just a little ways that way. Yeah, it wasn't flyable when I bought it. It was uh, kind of just pieced together. And uh, I took it apart, inspected everything. Uh, we put a new motor on it, and uh, it's flying great. And what motor do you have on here? This is a Rotax 447. Okay. It's air-cooled, so the 
original engine had a scoop on there and uh, they just free air cooled it. But this one here has a fan and it, uh, the fan blows through. Ah, blows okay, up. okay. What speeds did you make coming over here from Red Bluff, California? I was cruising about 60 to 65. Miles an hour? Miles per hour. Okay. Um, but with a good tailwind, I saw ground speeds of almost 80. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. So, you may not have that going home, so. Hopefully I, I have <laughs> the winds in my favor. If not, it's going to take a little longer. <laughs> That's right. So in this airplane here, you know, I'm looking at the panel edgewise and it's, uh, there's not much there, but you've added another gizmo to it. So tell me a little bit about your instrumentation in this okay, well, Spartan it, aircraft. It came with the EIS system, which monitors all the engine uh, temperatures and stuff and the RPM. And then up here, we've got the airspeed indicator, which comes out to the pitot tube out the side there. Okay. And then we've got right here an altimeter. I had to buy the altimeter, didn't have one. And then I put a handheld radio here, and I rigged the antenna out the back so I get a little better reception. Ah, okay. And what else did we do? Oh, and I put an iPhone right here so I can navigate <laughs> with uh, four flights. That's what I use. Oh, navigation. you use four flight, okay. Yeah. Well, so that brings this airplane into a modern age that Scott probably didn't quite envision. There were no iPhones back then. There were hardly cell phones back then. That's true. So. What do you think about what he's done here? Oh, I think it's fantastic, actually. What a beautiful pairing, an iPhone and an Airbike. <laughs> Does it get much better? But I've got to ask, so what was your route? Tell us about your adventure and your route flying out here. Okay, well, we started in, um, in Red Bluff uh, at the Dragonfly factory there. And then I flew to my hometown, which is just south of San Jose. That was a four-hour trip. Okay. And then um, from San Jose, California, we flew to Tehachapi in one day. And then- That was a pretty long flight. It was about six hours, yeah, and all across the desert, basically, across the San Joaquin Valley. And then it took one day to get from Tehachapi to here. Okay, so there's your three-day trip that you had. And your average uh, uh, altitudes and your maximum altitudes? My maximum altitude was 6,500. Uh -huh. uh, once you get about that high, this engine starts slowing down. It doesn't climb much more after that. I'm not sure where it stops, but it slows down about there. Yeah, right, right. And your minimum altitude? Oh, minimum was pretty low at times. <laughs> low, en low enough to to, uh, to wave to the workers in the fields. There you go. Pull up to get over the fence. I don't have a lot of experience flying. You know, I'm a new guy with 100 hours of experience. Uh, I'm barely landing it very, very um, graciously yet. Well, know? let's uh, let's back up and give you a little more credit than that because you're a new guy in powered aircraft. That's true. But tell me a little bit about your hang gliding and the amount of hours you got there and what you do with that hang glider. Well, I, um, I own a two-place hang glider and I, I teach people to fly in the Bay Area. A lot of people that have taken tandem flights from me have also went on to learn how to fly hang gliders. And uh, hopefully they'll graduate to power planes too, maybe. So but show I, me how you get in this one. What I do is I throw my foot over and then I have to lift my bottom up and set it down in the seat. And I usually leave the seatbelt in there. That way I won't forget to put, to put it on. Okay, that's valid. Here he goes, climbing in. And just kind of jumps into the seat. But see, now I can't put my feet on the ground. Oh, yeah, sure, that's a problem. The seat is stopping my feet. Yeah, so without those, you could put your feet right down and sort of stand like you do on a bicycle. Correct. When you want to get off the seat and just stand astride the frame. So we'll just add quickly the bucket seat was a big option that we came up with. And I mean, it was kind of poo pooed by some of the people at team. We thought some people might want that comfort and that security of harnessing yourself. Oh, you knew but that, what he just described, oh, yeah, you'd heard correctly. from people. The original air bike was you get on it, not in it, and we we wanted that small, very minimalist seating so you could straddle it. It, made, it was easier to ground handle, it was easy to get in, get out, right. and team, Wayne's uh, design philosophy was always minimal and simple, right, because that always works best. and. He would always say, aviation cost by the pound. <laughs> well, what weighs more, that bucket seat or the little plywood? Just the essence of weighing throughout uh, the aircraft. And Scott, there was something about the frame back here that was different that I thought you should point out to people. Uh, if you look carefully, you can kinda, I can see it here because I know where I'm looking. Sure. But most people would completely miss it. And what's that all about? Well, this was another fun story at Team, as most of them were. Uh, We'd done the jig, we'd done the, the whole fuselage, and, and we thought it was beautiful, it was art. And we started, Wayne comes up to me, he goes, man, well actually I was tasked with finding out our shipping costs to 
ship these things out. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a long fuselage, and it costs a lot to ship. So we discussed that. Well, the next morning, Wayne comes over to my desk and goes, Scott, I want you to come look at something. I might have an idea here. And he goes, you know, right back here, we've got this. We can put a little socket in there, and we can just, that tube, that top tube of the spine, it'll just ride into a socket. We've got the bolt back there for the diagonal wires. So the bolt exists. We can just use that bolt as a pin to hold the top spine in. And I'm still scratching my head, and I'm going, well, okay, Wayne, so what's up with that? He goes, down here on the bottom, we'll just put on these uh, two bushings, and we'll weld to that. And after we weld up those bushings, we're going to just cut them off. And through those bushings, we'll put in a bolt. <laughs> well, holy cow. So with that, the fuselage is only half its length. We can fold it over and put it in a, in a crate half its size, and you don't lose anything in strength. And if you need to, uh, to haul it somewhere, if you're out in a field or something, you can take it apart. It's a lot smaller. Again, Wayne's just simple, simple way of thinking and solving problems. Scott, I want to ask you a question now about the general construction of the airplane, your experience with team, of course, you can go through the whole bit. Tell us a little bit about how this airplane is assembled. Uh, well, of course, the fuselage is a 4130 uh, chromoly fuselage. We looked at doing 1018 steel, which you could have, but 4130, a little more robust and, and it made sense for us, we thought. Um, the wings are pretty much mini max wings ah, okay. uh, in the center section the uh, wing connections are at different locations so they wouldn't plug from a mini max into here but structurally it's a mini max but the way it's built from about this point out yeah. is sort of the same yeah 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 where the struts hook in and everything is the same on on all the aircraft so it's a mini max wing uh, principally um, and then uh, the struts a little bit different sizing on the struts and then the landing gear leg was a another beautiful exercise in simplicity. It's uh, again a 4130 leg and uh, with a, a, a nice an angle cut off yeah, here, yeah, an uh -huh. angle cut off here to spread the loads out of the gear going out. We looked at, in fact I had suggested uh, to Wayne, uh, let's do a, uh, a tapered aluminum leg. Uh, in Tennessee we had uh, the Bat Company over in uh, Murfreesboro, uh, and they did a lot of tempering of the aluminum baseball bats. And I thought, well, that would be an oh, easy I resource see, I see. and go into a nice tapered, a beautiful, elegant. And you know, I got this Wayne. I, this <laughs> look I got from Wayne often. This Scott, that's not simple. The builder that'll up the price to the consumer, and he won't be able to easily repair it. So we're just going to go with a straight leg, and it's correct answer it's simplicity not complexity i'm real good at complex stuff making things more complicated most Anyways, humans are actually sure. we tend that direction <clears throat> yeah. for whatever reason very elegant landing gear leg uh, again out of 4130 and then we covered up the front and our first thought actually was to cover up the whole fuselage yeah and why and, not uh, then well we looked at it and we thought it was beautiful with no covering and so we we left it that way and uh, in flying it, I found I love the crosswind capability because the wind just blows through it. Ah, yeah. It's beautiful in crosswinds. And, and, and yeah, very little uh, uh, vertical area for, from, sure. for side loading. I mean, a little bit up here, but not yeah. much. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the pilot represents about as much as that does. So, yeah. Right. Then, uh, of course, we had the windshield up here, uh, the engine up front. The first engine was a Zenoa. The little okay. G25. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the airplane did fine on it. Then we did the Rotax 25 horsepower, as I yeah. recall that. Right, right. Yeah. Then the uh, Rotax 277. Um, in fact, I think the first engine, one of them, we mounted upright, but we wound up putting it upside down because you got this nice clean cowl. Right, here. right. Really helped with the lines of the aircraft. We didn't want the spark plugs on the bottom, but there you go. Uh, they, they seem to work fine, yeah, though. I mean, they've, they've been, been upside down engines for yeah, yeah, right. long as I can remember in aviation. Yeah, it doesn't exactly seem to be a problem. Right. So it was just not a, not an issue at all. And again, a real elegant uh, motor mount tube. This is just a, actually like a Quicksilver root tube, a two inch square tube uh, that is bolted up and the engine hangs from it uh, with a couple with uh, rubber mounts. Again, very simple. Simple, simple, simple. simple uh, That's almost a Wayne, Eichen, Wayne Eisen thing, wasn't it? As oh, you said now a couple absolutely. of times. If you could make it simpler, it'll probably be better. Not only for 
you fellows doing the work of preparing it, but for the owner who gets it later and says, well, now I got to do things to it. Well, you Simple bet. is good. Is that right? That's absolutely. That was Wayne's whole thing. And, you know, a gift to make something, to me, it's difficult to make something very, very simple. It's it a really, really. A you got to think much harder about it. Well, right. And to get to the essence. Another example of that, the wing tip, the wing construction uh, was just a, the end of the wing is squared off. And I, uh, again, I got one of these looks from Wayne. I said, Wayne, let's do something with those wing tips. They're just, he goes, Scott, we do the links of plywood and the link, wing length is designed around common sizes of wood so that the guy can just buy it. The squared off tip is easy to build so that guys will finish the airplane. Uh, you got to you got to give uh, Wayne uh, a lot of points for his uh, sticking to what oh, he knew worked. Absolutely, absolutely. So then we did as an add-on because it's easy to add on. Then we got the wing tips and we played with different wing tips. The droop wing tips wind up looking nice and are, are effective. They help the ailerons and the low speed handling characteristics. Uh, so designing an airplane is always give and take and give and take and when you're collaborating with people it's just a fun fun project it's a fun exercise it's clear you enjoyed that experience oh, gosh, back yes. when gosh yes well we're going to wrap up this video a little bit mike but i want to ask you uh what do you is your route going home going to be essentially the same it's going to be the exactly same in reverse that's all right. right you land at the same places and get fuel again that's right <laughs> why not you already know the way now that's so right. Well, good luck getting back home safely and soundly, and uh, we'll uh, trust that, that we'll hear more from you about this. Con continue with the hang gliding, too. Personally, of great interest to me, and obviously all those. How many people have you taken up, did you say? I've taken 5,000, over 5,000 tandem flights. 5,000 wow. tandem yeah. flights. Now, that may not sound like a lot to some people, but just think about taking 5,000 flights in your airplane, and that puts it in perspective. That's what you do every time. Every time's a pre-flight, every time's checking out somebody. It's a lot of flying and you've done that safely, you said too, yes, so sir. good on you. Mike, tell us a little bit about how we find you. I know you don't sell this product, that's not what this is about, but if people want to ask you some questions or hopefully come out and do some hang gliding, where do we find you? Yeah, if you want to come out and do hang gliding or you want to ask me about the air bike, I'm learning as I go, um, but you can contact me through my website, which is sanfranciscohanggliding.com. Okay, very good. It's a real joy to be able to look over the team air bike. Uh, from so many years ago, I enjoyed flying this thing back in the 90s probably. I don't even remember anymore. Been long enough. Okay, thanks Mike uh, for that. And Scott, uh, you're not doing team these days. What are you doing now? Well, I import Jabu aircraft from Australia uh, to North America. And uh, we do that in our headquarters is in Denton, Texas, just north of Dallas. Our website is jabarulsa.com. So if you need something with more seats than this, or you want a little enclosure, you got all that kind of stuff in spades. If you want to take your dog or build a kit <laughs> or get a ready to fly cross country touring machine, we can help out. That's great stuff. So once again, the web address please. Is jabarulsa.com. Okay, that's real easy there. We'll put that up on the screen for everybody. You can find more about Team, you can find more about Jabaru and lots of other affordable aviation on bydanjohnson.com.